Happy webinar Wednesdays. It's Dr. <laughs> Deborah Thompson here. I'm here with Miss Amy Bond. She is not only the chief marketing officer of Gorilla Doctors, but also the strategic communications advisor at the One Health Institute that is associated with the University of California at Davis. Thank you so much, Amy, for joining us today. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, our pleasure. So I just had a mouthful of your titles. <laughs> I know, it's a little silly. <laughs> Chief Marketing Officer, and then also the Strategic Communication Advisor. Um, and these are big groups. These are big groups that are known around the world. Um, what's your story? How did you get here? Yeah. Um, oh boy. Well, so for Gorilla Doctors, um, that's the bulk of where I spend my time. The advisory position with the One Health Institute is part time. Um, and for my sort of personal story, so if anybody's not familiar with Gorilla Doctors, we're the uh, we're a nonprofit. We are based at UC Davis, but we are a global organization working in Rwanda, Uganda, and DRC, providing veterinary care to wild mountain and growers gorillas. So our hospital is the forest, and our patients are wild. Uh, even though they are human habituated, they are still wild animals. Uh, and when they get ill or injured, we intervene and try to save their life. So what I do is work on the marketing communication side for the nonprofit in you know, reaching out to donors and raising awareness about our mission. And how that started for me was, I became obsessed with gorillas uh, in the seventh grade. I, we had a life science project and they, we were assigned an endangered species to do a report on and I happened to be assigned the mountain gorilla. And that was basically it. Uh, they've been sort of my singular focus for most of my life. And I ended up in grad school at UC Davis working on a PhD in animal behavior but became a bit disillusioned with academia at the time where you know you were judged by publisher parish that still exists a lot but what's changed for the better is and it didn't exist when i was in school was a a value on the dissemination of that knowledge to a broader audience and at my core i'm a storyteller and you know, I'm passionate about gorillas. I'm passionate about the people and the communities that live around the parks where gorillas live and the world needs to know their stories. And as an academic that just didn't work for me at the time, uh, I've come full circle. I'm back at UC Davis and working as a science communicator in academia. So I don't know if that's karma or not, but that's what it is. <laughs> I love that. There's so, many, there's so many great things there uh, that you were just assigned in seventh grade mountain gorillas and you're like, wow, yep, this is it. This is where I want to be. That was it. <laughs> Incredible. Who has heard stories? Wow, the power, the power of opportunities, right? The power yeah. of experiences. That's incredible. Um, okay, so it sounds like you are very familiar with the One Health term. Where in your experiences, where in your story did you first learn about One Health and, and how you can get involved in it? That is such a great question. And I thought a lot about this um, because for myself, I didn't actually have the term or language of one health until I started with Gorilla Doctors. But I had spent my whole career effectively trying to tell that story of that intersection between the health of wildlife, animals, people, the environment, right? I mean, that's basically the idea of One Health is that it's all interconnected. And I didn't know that, that that's what I was doing. You know, because I started out when I left grad school, decided I wasn't going to pursue a PhD. I left with my master's and wanted to pursue market based approaches to social and environmental issues. And so I got into fair trade. And and um, and that was so much about empowering people at the local level and in multiple different ways, economically, uh, skills, all sorts of different ways that could indirectly reduce pressure on natural resources. 
right? Because they are craft and build alternative livelihoods. Um, that was, was that was the story I started weaving early on. You know, I kind of entered the market um, at the very kind of advent of cause-based marketing, um, social good marketing, and and would go around and do these press tours in New York around fair trade. And it was this huge educational curve, right? So you first had to educate people around what, what it was and then get them to buy into it, right? Um, and I think One Health has a very similar history and model when it comes to communicating what it means and why it's important. Great. So could you demonstrate, could you tell us the story of how, how you could bring a group of people to not only understand fair trade, but also care about it. Oh, yeah. So, so the biggest thing I would get is, and I think this is essential too in communicating is there has to be something they connect to at a gut or emotional level before you can begin that education process. Right. And, and it was something I was really grappling with. I'll go back to the fair trade in a second with one health pre-pandemic, because I think conceptually it's pretty easy to get up here. It's hard to hook, it was hard to hook people in here emotionally because it felt distant. And it was hard to see how me, Amy, was interconnected to these broader things, especially if I live on an entirely different continent than where gorillas are, for example, right? So with fair trade, it was, the first hurdle I had to overcome often was, so what's this free trade thing, right? Oh, no, no, not free trade. We have free trade. That's a whole nother conversation, <laughs> but this is called fair trade. And, you know, and what worked was in that particular case was very often in, certainly in the New York magazine world, because I was trying to get product placement, right? We were, we were dealing with fair trade handcrafts at the time. Um, in the early 2000s. Um, and where the great connection came there was so often those handcrafts are made by women, right? And, and you invest in women because in local communities, women invest in their children, whether it's their education, nutrition, or both. A lot of people in PR in New York are women and mothers, and they can relate to that and they understand that intuitively. And so when you start to talk about creating opportunities for women to empower themselves, right? Um, and, you know, it was, it just kind of would click. And then all of a sudden there would be a whole new understanding and respect for the products these women created. Right. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Okay. And I thought that was a really important answer for all the viewers to hear. That was great. So when you build a story, you are a professional communicator and particularly science communicator, which is amazing. I'm so happy to have this talk with you. Um, so how do you build a story? How uh, Our target audience with this um, webinar series is really scientists, engineers, you know, people who are great with writing public uh, publishable articles, you know, in peer reviewed journals, but not necessarily speaking with the public. So what do we all need to know? I think the biggest thing I try to remind myself is our biggest responsibility as science communicators to a broader audience is demystifying science, whether it's the process of or what the results mean or the implication of the results for everyday life. Um, I feel like that's our biggest responsibility. One of the things I've learned in working with academics and scientists who are just some of the most brilliant people and minds I've ever met in my life. And it, I find it a deep honor to be able to have that responsibility to translate their work for the public. Um, but one of the things I think that happens for the, the scientists themselves is the way you structure a scientific publication is almost the exact opposite of the way you communicate it to uh, the public, right? So in, in a scientific paper, it's here's our methods, 
here's the basic, you know, results, here's the statistical analyses we underwent, here's, here's the results and the meanings, and then here's what may be potential implications. You don't even always include implications in a scientific publication, right? You kind of leave that a bit open-ended. With, with sort of more sort of broad-based science communications, you want to lead with the results. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, hold on. Um, you want to lead with the, it's a hook, right? Like why, why, what's, why does it matter? What does it mean for me? And maybe what does it mean in a broader context, right? So you, you have to engage people first and then you can go get into the weeds, you know, about the, maybe the scientific methods that were used, um, you know, some of the questions or assumptions that they were addressing, things like that. Great. And so if you have a hook in your back pocket, you know, you have, you have your story hook, but not all hooks work for every audience. So how, what is your advice um, for various audiences for scientists? Well, the first thing is to know who your audience is as much as you can, right? Because it's also what you emphasize will be different for sure, right? Like you, you might need a different hook for a policymaker who, who has the power to enact legislation that could have, you know, profound conservation implications, for example, versus, um, you know, someone reading, say, Reader's Digest, you know. Um, so the, the first thing is to, is to try to, as best as you can, understand who your audience is. And in that, that means meeting them where they're at. You know, whether that's their understanding of science, whether that's um, their interest in, you know, I mean, you're gonna have a very different audience reading Scientific American than you are, say, Reader's Digest, right? So different audiences. So it sounds like the scientist has to do their homework before getting yeah, to- I think so. Yeah, you know, and, um, if they if they are if their intention is to reach a broader audience and have it be accessible it's worth doing that background right right and any tips for scientists who want to speak with media Oof, yeah that could be a whole different you know session of this of this um that's very different so I would say the top three things for scientists to keep in mind when they're talking to media. One, it depends on the platform. So TV is the most easily manipulated, right? Where they can pull sound bites out of context. So you wanna be really careful and go in prepared with short statements that are hard to take out of context. Right. And you kind of want to just keep repeating those over and over again. Uh, another big tip is to it's really easy to get nervous when you're being interviewed, whether it's TV or radio or podcasts, um, is to almost, you know, you could put those three key points. You want to have three key points that you want to make sure you try to hit home in each interview and you put those up on your computer or wherever you are and keep them you know, just visually accessible at all times to always bring yourself back and anchor to those. And don't be afraid of silence. You know, if, if they ask you a question and you're not sure, or you want a moment, a great way to buy yourself a little more time is to ask them to clarify what they mean or ask it in a different way. You might've got it on the first time, but it just gives you a little bit more time to think. You wanna to stick to your wheelhouse. That's another one. You know, depending on the publication, the journalist's agenda, um, you know, they might not be objective, they might not be open, they might be entering the interview with, with an agenda. Um, they might ask you leading or combative type questions. You can, it's okay not to answer. And it's okay to say, you know, that's really outside my wheelhouse. I'm not, you know, um, and then try to bring it back to one of your three points. Excellent, excellent. These are these are excellent answers. It's like you're a oh. communicator or something. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Excellent. 
So given the importance of communication and strong communication, not just learning about it in school, actually doing it, actually going out and doing it, applying your knowledge. Yeah. Um, what if for the future of One Health, One Health advocates, what do you, you want future One Health advocates to know or to practice to improve their science communication techniques? Great question. Um, well, the first thing I'd say is if they're already thinking through a One Health lens, they're way ahead of the game. Because so much about One Health is connecting dots, right? Across animals, across people, across ecosystems. That in and of itself gives you a cornerstone and a foundation for some pretty big and powerful stories and endless amounts of stories, right? and reaching different audiences through different entry points into that story, right? Maybe your entry point is the people aspect. Maybe it's the animal aspect. Maybe it's the ecosystem. You know, there's, there's just a world of opportunities to tell stories through the One Health lens. So um, I think one of the things I've been exploring a lot lately and thinking about more is you know, there's a there's a growing, I don't know if it's if movement is the right word, but knowledge and um, proactive engagement around decolonizing global health, right? And the historical context contexts of global health through uh, a Western centered lens, a white lens, um, and th these are important, essential conversations that need to be happening and changes and shifts in institutionalized global health. And One Health is not separate from that. You know, I think One Health grew out of that. It grew from a largely academic, white-centered, you know, concepts of. So I think One Health is unique in that it's not separate from that conversation and those, it needs to be looked at you know, is there a decolonization need within One Health? At the same time, the One Health approach can be used to dismantle systems that are, you know, historically oppressive or, you know, have a colonization lens. And I think we have a huge responsibility as communicators of One Health to incorporate that into our storytelling and our work and to question our own perspectives as the writers and communicators of where we're coming from in telling this story. Right. And there's more chatter around the world about decolonization of global health. For the viewers who this is their very first time they're hearing that term before in the realm of global health, can you break that down for the listeners, please? I can try. I'm still learning myself. Um, so I'll do the best that I can from what I've been learning. Um, and, you know, and mine is very much in a conservation lens, right? So I've spent most of my career working and studying over in East Central Africa, Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, that whole region, DR Congo, um, all have historical um, structures of colonialism, right? So white superpowers coming in, taking over, and colonizing, literally, their lands, their cultures, their traditions. That has long-lasting and profound implications with the way we approach healthcare, uh, the justice systems, um, which have health implications, education, right? So, so like, if you look, if you even bring it back into the context of the United States, we have, you look at the disparities in maternal health among white women versus women of color. Women of color suffer on every single level and category of maternal health, right? They have higher mortality rates during childbirth, um, you know, less access to prenatal care, every, everything, you know. Um, that example is probably a bit more related to sort of institutionalized racism as opposed to colonization, um, but it's a similar 
there's a similar context. I, I suppose in, in the US case, it would be the colonization of whites against indigenous people at the time when we arrived in on the continent of North America. Um, you know, what's great is because there's more and more being communicated about it, if this is new to you as a listener, go and Google decolonizing public health and you will get a, plenty of resources to start learning about what this means and how as a science communicator, you can start to weave that into your storytelling, but also make sure you're thinking about the way you present information in a more global context that respects alternative cultures and traditions and ways of doing things. Right, right. Is that and yeah, and it's about optics too. And what's funny is that when I was only in clinical medicine, clinical veterinary medicine, and when I heard optics, I'm like, okay, glasses? <laughs> like that, that word didn't even like equate to what I mean by optics today. Out, uh, optics for the benefit of every listener, optics is more like the perception of what, the, of the message that you're uh, sending out. So the outsider looking in to whatever you're doing. And so uh, bringing it full circle, it sounds like the optics, not just being aware of what you're saying, but also being aware of what people are seeing from you. Like right now I'm a, I'm a Caucasian woman, right? And I'm speaking about these things. So I have to be cognizant of all of the different factors. And that's a part of communication, right? Self-awareness. Absolutely. You know, and here's a very concrete example with gorilla doctors. We're, we're US based, but we're also the bulk of our staff are from the countries where we work. They're Ugandan, Rwandan, and Congolese. And all of our field veterinarians are from the countries where we work. So it just so happens that, you know, the way we sort of break down is that our marketing and communications and fundraising are based here in the US. And, um, but the bulk of the, our programmatic efforts are in the countries where we work. And one of the things I've tried to do, because again, I'm very aware of here I am telling the story of guerrilla doctors and the work we do on the ground in Africa as who I am, right? And, um, and so I've made a very conscious effort uh, and happy to receive feedback for people if they wanna go check it out um, to, bring the voices of our African staff front and center, right? And, and be the vehicle that they have to tell their stories, their perspectives, their experiences of working on the ground, because they're the experts. They are literally the gorilla doctors, right? I serve them. And, and that's truly how I see my role is serving their stories and the stories of the gorillas that we serve. and healthcare we monitor. Yeah, I just got chills. <laughs> I don't know if I'm doing it well every day, but I try. Well, don't we all, right? We all try. Yeah. Um, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you, Amy. Thank you again for taking the time to dedicate your, your afternoon um, to speak with One Health Lessons and myself. Um, this, I'm sure, has been a conversation that will affect many people, many people, and I'm sure for the better. So oh, I hope so. again, I hope so value. Yeah. <laughs> and good luck. good luck communicating. We need you. We do need you. Onwards and upwards. I'll see you next week. Thank you.